In today's video, I want to show you 10 dope Cinema 4D tips that I'm quite certain many of you haven't heard about. Let's get into it. First of all, of course, open up Cinema 4D. The first tip we're going to talk about relates to sound in your Cinema 4D scene. I don't know how many of you had that pain before, I had it a lot and I regret that I didn't know about it earlier. So what we will do now is go to window timeline F curve to reveal our timeline. Then I will create a null and call it with something obvious as sound. Drag it to your timeline, right click, add special tracks. At the bottom of the list there is sound, click it. And on your right, now you can select any track you need. I will extend our scene's duration to 500 frames so that we would be able to hear it. If you need to visually see the waveform, you could go to keyframe mode and expand that sample track.wav file. Here you go, you have your waveform right here. Now you can animate your scene precisely following the soundtrack. How cool is that? Very handy. Alright, next tip is related to timeline as well. Let me quickly create something with a lot of ob objects. All right, we'll make it editable and expand the list. We have a lot of objects, all right? Let's uh, set up a primitive animation so that we would have some keyframes in the timeline. Okay, Doc, and go to your timeline. If I would select uh, the objects in the timeline, I would see their keyframes, their splines, all that fun, but I don't know which objects are which. When there's hundreds of those objects, it becomes very painful. If I want to animate this one, for, for instance, I don't know which one is that in that list on the left. I honestly don't know why it's not set up by default, but have a look. Go to view, link, link TLOM selection, which means link timeline to object manager. Now, if I'll select something in my viewer, it selects automatically in the timeline, which is handy. But if I'll select something in the timeline, it doesn't select anything in the viewer. To fix that, go to view link again and uncheck that one directional selection linking. Now the linking works both ways. If you select something in timeline, it selects automatically in the viewer. If you select something in the viewport, I have no idea why I called it viewer. If you select something in the viewport, it selects automatically in the timeline. And in some situations, it's like a lifesaver. Okay, done with that one. Next one relates to the way you animate stuff, the convenience again. So for example, let's take that size here, right? Select X, Y, Z, right click, add to hood. And here we have a window with all the parameters. If you would control click and drag it, you can place it wherever you want on a screen. If you would unselect the object, this little overlay control disappears. To fix that, right click the overlay, show and click always. So now when you unselect the cube, the little overlay stays forever. And now you can control all, all these parameters without the cube being actually selected and it comes really handy during your animation se sessions. I'll quickly show you my other setup with this little robot. Okay, this is a little bit messy, it wasn't like that when I was setting it up, but since then I updated to R20, so maybe that causes the chaos. Here we go, so see, in this case we have a lot of parameters to control in order to animate this little drone, and it's really handy without actually expanding a whole tree in the object manager and trying to animate all those parameters individually. Alright, this was tip number three. Moving to the tip number four. This will be a little animation method, comes in handy with quite a few scenarios. For example, let's say if I have a wire on a desk, all right, and there is something happening on a desk surface and I need that cable to interact with the rest of the scene. Instead of building complicated uh, rigs, I would use this method. So if I would need to animate the point and click the keyframe, nothing would happen, of course, why would it? But there is a handy mode in Cinema 4D that um, many of us overlook by some reason. Check this out, click it. Now let's set up the keyframe, move the slider a bit, move the point, keyframe again, it moves. Here you go. 
Now you can animate your spline point by point if that's something you wish to do. As I already mentioned, it comes handy with uh, some little tiny animations of the wires, for example, helps a lot. Okay, next one. Next one is inspired by the questions I received after my uh, paper village breakdown. People ask how did I record the time lapse of putting the buildings in the scene. Well, it's really simple. We have all those views in here, right? If I would mid middle click, I would see all my four view panels. Let's place this little dude here. All right. But what if I would want to work in this view panel and uh, see the character from particular angle in then another view panel? So I have a de dedicated button here. It, it's called create a new view panel. And it's basically a second viewport that can expand to four view panels. It can be a perspective view panel from a particular angle. And whatever you do in your main one, this one won't change. You can get to it by clicking window, new view panel. And here you have it. And this is exactly how I recorded uh, that layout setup of the village from one perspective. I was actually doing everything in that main viewer while the screen capture software was recording something else on another screen. So see, whatever I do in the main one, the right one remains untouched. Okay, next one. Let's create a lot of objects so that I would be able to show it. This one refers to the materials and uh, how painful it might be managing them in the object uh, viewer. I'll create two materials, blue one and red one. Assign them to my platonics and make the cloner editable so that we would have shit loads of objects. Cool. Now, let's say I progressed a lot with this project and made this cloner editable ages ago. There is no turning back and I suddenly need to change some red objects to blue ones. Oh my goodness. What would you do? Assign the materials manually? There should be a better way of doing it. Definitely. Okay, right click on the, your material, select texture tag and objects. All right, all red materials are selected and just drag that blue one into this field here. Here you go, all your materials replaced. There is another cool way of doing it and it comes handy when you're importing some OBJs with their, you know, random white materials on them. In that case, you would want to hold Alt and drag your blue material over the red one. That way it replaces the material and uh, deletes the one that you want to be replaced. If you don't want to lose the material you're replacing, then just use the first method. Oh gosh, so many good tips. Okay, next one. Sometimes uh, for animation purposes or for preview purposes, we don't want to see textures and materials on certain objects. I'm not talking about disabling all the object, uh, all the textures in the scene. I'm talking about some control. So what you want to do is cl right click on the what uh, on whatever you want to disable texture on. Go to Cinema 4D Tags Display. All right. Check Use Textures and uncheck Textures. That um, it just disables textures in this null, and you can change it. You can assign this tag to any group, to any individual object, and it comes in really handy during animation, during modeling process. If you don't want to remove the texture from the object you're modeling, just use this tag. Great. <laughs> Next one is probably a bit ridiculous one, but I um, think many of you will find it quite useful. So you know, when you hold shift in Cinema 4D and trying to rotate something, move something, it snaps by 10 centimeters or 10 degrees. So whenever you need to rotate something to 45 degrees, it's, you usually end up uh, entering those values manually. But there is a way to change that. Click mode right here, go to modeling tab, and there go to quantize. And here you have your settings by how many units Movement, scaling, and rotation will work. Does that make sense? No, probably not. Just change rotation to five degrees, all right? And now when we shift rotate this cube, it rotates by five degrees instead of 10. And you can easily do your 45 degrees rotations. All right, silly but useful little tip. Next one is a bit better and comes from a bigger pipelines. 
In fact, I didn't know about it, its existence in Cinema 4D until my uh, production software's guide video was released. And in this video, I was moaning that Maya has that feature and that allows to optimize the workflow, blah, blah, blah. And then the director of uh, Maxon said like, hey, Andre, listen, actually Cinema 4D has this as well. And that's exactly what I will show you now. Let's click create. Down there, there is a XREF, add X ref and select something from another scene. In my case, I will select the drone I already showed you. So basically what this one does is creating an instance of another scene in this one. Why is it um, useful? Well, for example, let's say I'm animating this little drone in this scene. I don't know, he waves with his hands, whatever. Let's place his hands in an uh, unusual position. Okay, save it somewhere. And let's imagine this was a big, 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 big project with a lot of animation, I don't know, crazy scene, all right? And then clients come back and says, I don't know, put a pink kitten on this drone, whatever. And sometimes it means basically to redo a lot of stuff, which we don't want to do. Now let's go to the original scene of this drone. It's the same drone that we just animated in another scene, but this one is in its original position and we can change him. For example, let's use my little trick with replacing textures and replace this texture. Make the drone red, all right? Now save the scene. Oh, I I left that disable texture tag here. Let's remove it. Now you see our animated modified scene with the XREF in it, with instance in it, updated automatically. And we don't lose all the animations we already had. We just animated the source of the instance and the instance gets updated automatically. We can add details to the body of this drone, change textures, repaint it, remodel it while being able to animate it in another scene, which is pretty cool. Let's go to original one, change the material to the green one this time, jump back to our new scene and click reload. How cool is that? We maintain all our animations, kind of positioning, whatever it is we're doing, but we can modify the original model in another scene. This is extremely cool. Next tip relates to some pipeline optimization again. Let's create a cube, let's create a platonic, whatever. And then when you're ready to render, what you would usually do is going to your Cinema 4D settings, go to save, select your format, all that fun. Save the project in the first place, of course, to desktop, project folder, whatever fancy project. Then you would select the location where you want your renders to be saved. Now you have your path here. C users libreoff desktop project folder render test. Okay. And of course, as expected, the render is saved here. That's all cool. But for me personally, that's kind of painful because look how many workstations I have and they all have different names. Coruscant, Dantooine, Dathomir, Mandalore, Yoda, the Hunter's Hut. I'm a big Star Wars fan. So whenever I'm uh, sending this project to those machines, I need to reset up this path because that username Libroff wouldn't work on those machines. Okay, how to optimize that stuff so that I don't have to manually rewrite those locations all the time. So I'll delete all that stuff. And instead of this, I'll just place a dot, save the project. Actually, let's save it to another location. So that's our path. Let's click render, done. Let's go to the epic proof folder. Here we go, render and render is saved there. So with this setup, wherever you will save your project, it will create these folders and save your renders in there. If you have several shots, you can go render shot one slash test, whatever. For me personally, when I'm done setting up the scene on my laptop, I'm sending it to my Datomir machine, which is a master in my render form. And I don't have to reset up anything. It's already set up and it will render to the same location, both on my laptop and on my master render machine. This is super handy, I must admit. That would be it for today. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it because these little tips saved me in many different cases. I particularly like the last two tips about uh, 
uh, pipeline optimization especially helps with the projects when you have to think about so many different things. Let me know in the comments down below if you like that sort of content, if I should keep doing those little tips, you know, maybe 10 per video. Maybe you don't like it, I don't know. Thank you for watching and I see you in the next one. Peace.